All right, well, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, and I think to our panelists, I want to say thank you to our city councilman, Mayor Stout, um, Councilman Cody Kennedy, Councilman Randall Wrights, and Councilman Abe Herman. I guess you are the deputy mayor, is that right? Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you for making time for us today. Um, and I'm going to have our, our other panelists introduce themselves, but certainly Dr. Michelle Sunkel has been a driving force behind this Masters of Social Work program. And so if I might, I might start because we're here with a special guest and a special partner in Rocky Mountain Health Plans and CEO Patrick Gordon, um, who's going to take a moment here momentarily to share some things with our community, which we're, we're really looking forward to. But maybe if I might start, Marie, can we maybe grab the mic? I know we've got an audience both online and <laughs> at home. So if you wouldn't mind, and then maybe, Jamie, you could also make an introduction. That would be great. Um, my name is Mari Hibbard. I am from Intermountain at St. Mary's. I am the supervisor for the behavioral health team there. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been in practice for 22 years or a really long time. Now I feel old. Uh, Jamie actually happens to be an intern on my team. Um, and we, of course, are very pro-social work and know that we need more social workers in this community and are thrilled about the master's program here and the students it's producing. and. Um, hoping they all stay in our community uh, to work amongst the various social service agencies. My name is Jamie Motes. I am in the MSW program. I'm graduating in May. Um, yay! I got my bachelor's in psychology from Mesa State College um, and then will graduate in May with my MSW. Um, my internship is at St. Mary's Emergency Department and really hoping to stay local there, but also just really excited to get involved in our community um, on the systemic level to create change through social work. Yeah, do you want to go ahead and make a quick introduction, Dr. Sunkel? Sure. I'm Dr. Michelle Sunkel. I'm the MSW Program Director. Um, we are up and running, so we've got our students, we've got three faculty plus me, so four full-time faculty. We have currently 30 plus students out in the community doing um, social work 15 to 20 hours a week. And we're just really excited about the collaborations and connections in our community and for our students to stay locally and really fill in some of the community gaps and services that we have. As we're welcoming our partners from Rocky, um, it's this discussion is coming on the heels of the city of Grand Junction and this city council in particular really stepping up and um, showing just a, a tremendous amount of vision and, and leadership on this issue of providing support for mental health. And so I wonder, Mayor Pro Tem Herman, if maybe you would start and we could just go down the line, maybe both introduce yourselves, but also um, any thoughts or reflections about why the city chose to get involved in uh, this issue of supporting mental health providers here locally. Uh, I'm Abe Herman. I'm Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Grand Junction. Is this loud enough? I, I can't hear out there. Um, so I was elected to City Council in uh, 2021 and have served as Mayor Pro Tem since 2022. Um, I also, along with Randall and one of our other council members, Dennis Simpson, served on the ARPA committee, which um, the, the funds that this is coming from, the American Rescue Plan Act, was a response to COVID. and and the impacts that had on society and, and how to respond to that while also creating more resilience for the future. And during those discussions, we created a, a committee uh, to decide how we were gonna use all of this one-time money that came into the city uh, with a variety of, of different you know constituents and representatives of the community, some in the mental health space, um, some in the homelessness space, housing, just kind of across the board. And ultimately, uh, the ARPA committee identified three areas that we would like to, to work in or that they would like to work in. We were just the liaisons. Um, and those were housing, homelessness, and mental health. Uh, and it, it was fairly easy to find projects for housing and homelessness. There's immense need there. There's also immense need in mental health, but it was much harder to figure out how to actually do something about that with one-time money. Um, because with ARPA money, you're leaning towards capital projects rather than ongoing operational uh, money. And so 
we got some great housing projects, got some great homelessness projects, but the mental health piece, while there was a great idea from uh, Dr. Raul Villegas Decker, there wasn't really a sponsoring organization. And, and I think that's a good time for me to hand it off to Randall about how those conversations came out of that and then continued into to what was able to develop with CMU out of this. Thanks, Abe. Yeah, I'm Randall Wrights, uh, Director of Behavioral Medicine at St. Mary's Family Medicine Residency and at City Council. And so for me, uh, mental health and behavioral health has always been very personal. That's been my profession, my uh, life pursuit, and uh, just uh, trying to think about how do you use one-time funds to really advance the mental health of our community. And it just made complete sense for us to partner with uh, CMU with their um, brand new MSW program to uh, find ways to keep their graduates in town. And so that's how we got where we are. Hi, so I'm Cody Kennedy and uh, also a member of city council. Um, my um, interaction and perspective on mental health is a little bit different. As a retired police officer who has uh, experienced up close and personal um, the high suicide rates in our community, um, and also just the people that are really struggling for lack of service. And so that really was something that hit home with me when I was actually, prior to my election, when I was going to those ARPA um, fund um, meetings and where those decisions were being made about where that money was going to be a, be spent. Um, Dr. Uh, Ra Raul uh, Davia Gastecker um, had made some great suggestions early on. I knew him previous to that, so I had in the last four or five months had a few meetings with him, maybe even six months ago, um, just separately from that and saying, what more can we do? Um, stemming from that and stemming from really what that what the real problem was and quantifying that, um, he directed me back to uh, talk to uh, Randall a little bit more about some things that we might be able to do in partnership with CMU and the, in a real forward-looking way to um, really bolster the mental health capacity within the city of Grand Junction. So that conversation continued and we, uh, we decided this was really something that we could sink our teeth into to try and do something good for the future of Grand Junction. I'm, I'm Mayor Anna Stout, and uh, I also am the CEO of the Royce Hurst Humane Society. And part of my role in both as a, an elected representative of the city and as a, an employer uh, in the community, working in an area that's nonprofit related, it's seeking to address a need in the community, um, often social needs. What we saw at Royce Hurst was that so many of the reasons that animals come into the shelter are people-caused reasons, people problems, not animal problems. And so Royce Hurst was one of the first animal shelters in the country to hire a human social worker as one of our staff members. And eight and a half years ago, that was unheard of. She is actually about to graduate in May uh, alongside you, Ashley DeGrado, and she's phenomenal. She's amazing. Um, but part of it was the recognition that so much of what happens in our world, social work is not just um, in the really obvious places, but it really permeates every aspect of society. And when we look at the work that nonprofits are doing, you can typically find an intersection with mental health or um, social needs that people have in most of the areas that nonprofits are serving and many for-profits as well. So it's the recognition through that work that really carries over into our role as local elected officials. Our, we are often um, asked to solve very acute problems in the city. And people bring things to the city all the time and ask the city to fix this or to solve this or to fund this. And uh, really our job as elected officials is to look at the systems within our community and to have a multi-systemic approach to how we serve our community, acknowledging that while we are not mental health providers, mental health uh, permeates our, our community and it intersects with everything that uh, our residents are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So part of why this partnership is so important to me is the, the recognition that the community um, has a need and that the city is part of the players that are, are addressing those needs, but we do it best when we do it in partnership and when we acknowledge the intersection of uh, things like mental health and our police department and our parks and recreation department and the utilization of city services and that when we talk about having a high quality of life in this community, um, none of those things can happen if we aren't looking at everything that impacts the systems and all of those inputs. So that's what's exciting about this to me 
is that we have, with CMU in many instances, shown the way that partnerships uh, between the university and the city and private entities and nonprofits uh, actually advance the work that we're doing uh, much more significantly and much further when we work together on those things rather than working, you know, staying in our own lanes and working in silos. So this is why I'm really excited about this project. I also feel like I, I should be the one to mention that nothing is official until this evening. The city council has not taken any votes yet, so we need to make sure that we are talking about possible uh, funding and potential funding and a potential partnership until uh, somewhere around 6.30 this evening. Four. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I do want to just recognize, you know, Mayor, thank you. I think the four councilmen you see up here today in particular just showed a lot of um, not just leadership in terms of like where it could go, but really getting to the detail about how to improve this idea and really make it better. It started as a concept and really is refined into something that I think is going to really improve Grand Junction and that is uh, a lot of credit to the four of you. So as we were chatting with the city council, um, there was, shall we say, a strong encouragement that we try and find private partners in this conversation. And, you know, anybody that's been in this community for any amount of time knows that one of the leaders in this community for decades has been Rocky Mountain Health Plans. And, uh, our predecessors and their predecessors, our, our relationship goes back a long ways. And so it is just a, a real thrill to welcome Patrick Gordon, the CEO of Rocky Mountain Health Plans, to join us today um, and to help kick off this conversation. So Patrick. Uh, thank you, President Marshall. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here today um, and delighted to, to make a commitment to the community um, that's directly in alignment with all of the needs you have articulated and many of the needs that uh, several of us have been working on together for years now. Um, Rocky Mountain Health Plans is uh, pleased to announce that we will be making a $500,000 commitment uh, to CMU, uh, essentially matching the city's commitment and effectively doubling the workforce uh, capacity opportunity that we have. Uh, for us, that's a non that's a that's a no brainer, right? Uh, we know uh, that behavioral health is complicated. There's a maldistribution of the workforce. Um, there's not a great economic model uh, for uh, students interested in that training or finding placement afterwards. Certainly in uh, communities that uh, lack those resources, and and most communities do, but it's particularly pronounced on the western slope. Uh, so when President Marshall uh, approached us, uh, we, we jumped at the chance. Um, a community-based solution is always more effective. It always reaches uh, the needs uh, uh, faster than we can when we work uh, through systems. And we know that the systems that uh, in many ways gave rise to this problem need to be reformed. But we don't need to wait for federal action. We don't need to wait for state action. This is where the action is. and. Again, uh, if you think about it, uh, the uh, workforce that CMU is going to produce, uh, that, that is producing, and that it will grow through these, through these types of commitments, um, can plug in to so many different settings. Uh, you know, I, I could go on and on <laughs> about where the needs are, but uh, they're present in law enforcement, they're present in, in paramedicine, they're present in uh, human services settings, they're present in healthcare settings. They're present in organizations and private uh, uh, workforce settings. And so we know that the key is to bring services to where people are, not expect people to find those services. The healthcare system is complicated enough. It's costly. Um, and people really struggle. They struggle with, with basic coverage, and they struggle with access to care, especially uh, in the behavioral health space. So creating a local workforce creating this opportunity uh, to build capacity in a wide variety of settings is something that we know is not just the right thing to do for the health and well-being of the community, but in the long run, it will improve the economic uh, status of the city, it will improve uh, the cost of health care, it will improve the health of the overall population. So again, that's our, that's our job, and we're very pleased to be, be a part of this. Thank you. 
Patrick, I just want to say on behalf of the entire community, thank you for this. This is, um, I think, between what the city and Rocky are going to do, the number of lives that are going to be impacted in a positive way is, um, is really staggering because it's not just the individuals that will be getting the uh, assistance to get the kind of education that we all need, but the number of lives that those people will touch, the multiplier is really staggering. And I wonder, Patrick, if we can go back to you for a quick minute. I think, I think a lot of folks in this region understand over many decades what Rocky has done, but your business has changed a little bit in recent years. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about this idea of behavioral health deserts and the work that Rocky's doing throughout rural communities to try and um, both, one, recognize what are those holes and gaps, and two, some of the work that you all are doing. So, so Rocky, uh, again, was a community-based solution 50 years ago. Um, you know, the community uh, leadership, the, the healthcare leadership at the time recognized that the needs of the community won't be met if we wait. Uh, we really need to build our own resources. And so that's, that's kind of baked into our, our DNA. And Rocky has had a longstanding mission that uh, if we're going to do anything, we need to include everyone. There is no community if everyone is, is, in, is not included. There's no community if people can't get access to the basic services that they need. So that's been a long-standing commitment over many years and many different changes in our organization. But you know, 10 to 15 years ago, we saw what was on the horizon. And back in those days, uh, and still unfortunately to too large an extent today in healthcare, behavioral health was sort of done Behavioral health was something done by someone else, somewhere else, for somebody else. And yet it has a vital impact on the health of the community. And so uh, rather than just spending the next 10 years reshuffling the deck chairs of healthcare, <laughs> we, we really wanted to put a, a stake in the ground around a commitment to behavioral health. Um, and so we were fortunate to do that. We, we really began in primary care settings where, you know, that's kind of the backbone of the healthcare system, it's the backbone of a lot of what we do. And um, you know, began kind of coming up with financing mechanisms to make funding available in healthcare settings. You'd think it would be readily available, but it's not. <laughs> Much of that coverage does not exist. And so we began trying to plug the holes. And you know, we're we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years. Um, I have statistics that show over the last five years we've been able to grow the number of providers participating in our behavioral health programs by 76%. And those aren't just people with names on a list. Those are people actively providing services, actively billing for services. And, and we can count the individuals who've been uh, affected and touched as well. And then beyond just creating that base level of access, there's a tremendous range of evidence-based programs that we need to support. It's not just access. <laughs> just like any other uh, area of healthcare, there are specialized uh, and sometimes very high intensity programs that are completely absent in, in many places, especially uh, Western Colorado. And so our strategy has been, uh, again, just to respond to kind of the big trends that we see, but keep, in, keep connected uh, locally so that whatever we do can have immediate impact, can be course corrected when necessary with, with direct community feedback. Um, but we're now at a place with resources like MSU is putting together, uh, several of the other healthcare providers and organizations of the community are putting together. We're at a place now where <laughs> we, we can begin thinking about, okay, how do we evolve, uh, again, like I touched on, how do we evolve programs like co-responder and community paramedicine? How do we reduce the acute burden that falls on the city and the healthcare providers when those, when, when those needs go unaddressed or they get addressed at the highest level of resource intensity. How can we begin to enhance substance use treatment? You know, Grand Junction and Western Colorado is very fortunate to have strong community mental health systems, uh, uh, a hospital, um, and substance use treatment programs. Um, and that's just the start, but you know, we need, we need a much broader array of services to meet people where they are, particularly as we look at the trends we're seeing. Uh, significant trends in addiction, depression, uh, you know, issues with obesity, uh, that, that, those are all serious trends that healthcare can't fix on, it, on its own. Uh, community response is really 
necessary, and behavioral health is at the heart of that. So that's why we're here. And you know, it's interesting because I, I look back and I think, oh my God, where were we? And I primarily focus on how much work we have yet to do. But uh, this is great. You know, this is a great milestone. And again, thank you, CMU, and thank you, uh, City of Grand Junction. Patrick, thanks for that. I, I'd like to turn maybe Dr. Sunkel, for those maybe watching at home, why an LCSW? And, and maybe just give us a, a thumbnail sketch of what that credential is and why it matters so much for this region. And then, um, and if you wouldn't mind pivoting a little bit about, in addition to what that, that credential is and how, you, how one goes about earning it, why is it so challenging to earn that credential uh, that maybe sets the table for why we've doubled into this pro program a little bit? So the LCSW is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Colorado. And to get your LCSW means that you have to graduate with a master's in social work. Then you have to continue doing clinical practice for 3,360 hours, so full time for a minimum of two years. And you have to pass a clinical exam. Um, for those that are really interested, you could take two exams. You could take a generalist and then a clinical. And you have to have 96 hours of face-to-face -face supervision. So to get your LCSW means that you will practice at the highest level, means that you can do independent practice, means that you can end up in director roles, means that you can supervise, um, you could end up owning your own practice, you could end up in higher education, but it means that you have the credentials and qualifications to practice independently and that you have the skills to do it. So getting your LCSW is really important in our career. It also really sets apart why would you stop at an MSW, which says, yes, you have the schooling, but why wouldn't you want to continue on and have those additional credentials and val uh, verifications that say, yes, I also understand how academics relates back to um, the technical language, the diagnosing, the theories, and the interventions. And so the LCSW is really important. And when we're looking for hiring, we want LCSWs because it means they can practice independently. It means they can bill Medicaid and um, Medicare. It means that when we're working for different agencies, they're going to be able to get funding to support our positions. So the LCSW is really important in our community because we have a huge lack of LCSWs. So not only do we need the MSWs and we need our graduates, but we need them to continue on to get the um, advanced credentialing. A fair amount of work, you've got a couple of years of intensive schooling and then you've got all this additional work. And so I wonder, Jamie, if you might chat with us a little bit about what that journey's been like for you as a student and both what drew you into the profession, but um, just maybe frankly, I mean, I know, you know, you got kiddos, you got life, you're trying to work through everything right. and how you've navigated this program. Sure. Um, I started this journey as a college and career advisor at Central High School. And I daily would have students come into my office. Um, we would, the conversation would start about college and it would most often time would delve into, you know, issues with family, issues with friends, issues with depression, issues with mental health. And I wanted to be able to support them. I wanted to be able to intervene, but I didn't know how. Um, I didn't know what was the best thing to do. They, you know, I would send them back to their counselors who were wonderful school counselors, but I knew that there was something more to do. I knew that there had to be more and I was not satisfied with what I, you know, just sending them to someone else. I wanted to be a part of um, that process. Um, so from there, I found out um, that they were starting this program and I got to meet with Dr. Sunkel, um, who was speaking the language of what my heart was saying and what I wanted to do. And she was putting language to it. And I was like, that is what I wanna do. I wanna be a part of systemic change. I wanna be a part of offering these kids um, who are my kids' friends. They're at, you know, some of them are at my house. Some of them are on my kids' teams. I wanted to be able to offer them something that was meaningful, that would create change. Um, I had the heart, I had the desire, I just didn't know what to do. Um, and I think there's a bunch of other people just like me who are in the same boat, that this is so substantial for them to now have, I know what to do, I know where to go, and now I have support, I have money that can help me get there. 
Um, so this journey has been, um, it has made me, it's given me skills. I've um, been working at St. Mary's. I've learned how to intervene with suicidal ideation. I've learned how to recognize when people need additional help. I've learned about all the resources that our community has. And I now am equipped, or I will be in May, <laughs> um, to direct them and to create change for them. Um, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of long days. It's been a lot of um, learning, a lot of reading, a lot of critical thinking, a lot of my brain just growing beyond what I thought I could um, to really get to the point where I feel like I now can um, intervene and be a part of it, um, a part of change in, in our community. Um, and having this um, opportunity now for, for me and for people like me who are entering into this to not have to worry about what job do I pick um, in order to pay my student loans while I really want to be a part of um, our community, um, to now have that be taken off the table as a stress that they, that those of us who are graduating can really focus on doing the work instead of you know, having to get another job in order to support what we really wanna do. So, so thank you on behalf of the students for doing that. Ari, I wonder if you wouldn't mind chatting a little bit about some of the workforce challenges that you have faced as you do this work and trying to both recruit and retain uh, outstanding caregivers and clinicians in the work that you're doing? Well, my team's always hiring, so if anyone's interested. <laughs> um, yes, they're always, for whatever reason, I, I think St. Mary's, um, you know, I've been there with the psychiatric team 15 years, so we definitely have longevity in our team. People stay, they like the work, but that still means we're always hiring. They're, they're, for whatever reason, it's really hard to keep um, uh, especially doing crisis work, a lot of the turnover is usually two years. Is all people can sort of handle staying in kind of a crisis type setting, which an ER uh, primarily is. Um, so yeah, we have challenges keeping clinicians. It's hard to find um, an LCSW. We've now become more flexible, where we're like, okay, um, we'll we'll take an LPC. That's great. Oh, a master's, we'll train you on the job and provide supervision for two years. Like we've had to be really flexible. Um, to try to make sure we have the workforce available. Um, and I think the downsides when we don't is, um, and, and not just at St. Mary's, but in any place in the community, when your teams don't, aren't running at full capacity, you know, someone needs to see a therapist, there's no therapist available. Someone needs a crisis response and there's no one from co-response to respond, so they get an ambulance ride. I mean, there's just these layers of effects that we see when we don't have enough clinicians. Um, working working in the field um, and social workers social work is nice because it's you can work in a variety of different settings um, but I think all of those settings feel the the workforce shortage and trying to find ways to recruit and to get people to stay and to understand that Western Colorado is amazing um, and even as amazing as it is it's still challenging uh, to find clinicians that want to come and and then to get them to stay in our community so this program's amazing because we'll get someone like Jamie that hopefully stays at St. Mary's and can kind of grow our teams from within. Turning to our friends in the city council, you know, you all get to see kind of the broad spectrum of community needs. And I wonder, this is sort of posed to all three of you, so maybe you could take, maybe take different uh, perspectives or lenses to this, but you know, we talk in terms of community building, we talk in terms of economic development, uh, how do you see these sorts of programs and partnerships fitting into the overall vision for the city? So from, I, I really like that you put that economic development piece in there, uh, President Marshall. I think that that's relevant and I think it's worth discussing. If we're going to be uh, an economically thriving community, one that's focused on growth and forward looking, for success for decades ahead, we do need to build out these systems within our community. And I think that this is one of the greatest examples of how a municipality like ours can play a part without doing that heavy lifting that needs to be done by the university, by the hospitals, but how can we support that? And so being somebody that thinks about the economics of our community a lot, I think that this is, this is a great opportunity for us to invest. And that's, that, that ARPA money, those federal funds that we received for us to in turn, turn around and push, put them in a direction that's so forward looking. Um, I'm, I'm really 
glad we were able to do that and glad we were able to partner in that way. Yeah, I'd like to just honor Rocky Mountain Health Plans and Patrick Gordon in particular for your years of vision in this area. Um, going back 13 years, um, Rocky helped us to start our first fellowship for doctoral family therapists and then um, stepped forward later and um, paid for a three-year project to train uh, rural primary care clinics on how to do integrated behavioral health services and all at a big expense to Rocky Mountain Health Plans. And then, I mean, they, they give our clinic, we, yes, we, they pay for our, our Medicaid billing, but also they give us uh, global payments every year that c pretty much bankroll our entire training program. Now we're training five therapists every year. Um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing history. I, I think about uh, health insurances get a, a deserved bad rap for being about the bottom line and being more about <laughs> not. But Rocky has this view of, I think your view is much more about the population we live in, the communities we live in, and how do we um, build the communities to support health from the ground up. And I think that's a real credit to you and your, your corporation. And I, I would echo Randall's thank you to you for matching this. And we now not ha have not just half a million, but a million dollars going towards this program. And I know our hope, and I, I think the hope of President Marshall and CMU is that this is seed funding to let that grow and continue and perpetuate where we've been a community who historically has a, a real dearth of mental health professionals. Hopefully in the future we have a glut or at least enough, um, enough for everybody in the community. And, and I think one thing that our council really does well, you know, coming out of our strategic planning um, when the, the newer council members came on is we've really taken a holistic view of, of what a successful community is. You know, you can look at each individual element of economic development or, um, you know, transportation or whatever it might be, but the fact is there's too many moving parts to say we're going to focus on this. We have to focus on everything, and you can't necessarily focus in that way. So to, to Cody's point, being able to work with these partners and, and the things that you guys do so well in your MSW program as, as a insurer, at, you know, as mental health professionals, that's not what we do in the city. But hopefully this one-time funding with the partnership, with the collaboration that we have on the Western Slope, we can really have an impact on it with those one-time funds and set something up that, I mean, to to your point, the the network of effects that this is going to have is just kind of mind-boggling when you think about each one of those mental health professionals you know at the very least staying in the community for three years with the seed money but hopefully putting down roots and staying here for many years to come and then the effects on their patients and on their patients families and and the generations to come from that i mean this is something that can change a community in a big way and that that kind of gives me chills to think about how this money will will influence so many lives in a positive way. Yeah, thanks for that, Abe. I, it, yeah, it is hard not to get a little bit, uh, a little bit excited about those kind of long-term investments. Patrick, you, you all, I think, raised some things for us a few years ago as we were having this conversation, and Dr. Sunkel has been patiently explaining to me this whole uh, program and profession. But one of the things that you raised that I, I, I'd love for you to just take a minute and share a little more about is this idea of a network of providers throughout all these behavioral health deserts and the, the work and maybe how you envision, um, you know, as we continue to put out MSWs that are pursuing that LCSW, your vision for seeing these communities start to get the providers and the care they need in a really coordinated and, and smart way. So uh, that's, that's really exciting to me because it's not just making a financial investment or even understanding the rationale for the investment. There, as we've discussed, there are many, many reasons for this investment. And you know, frankly, everyone benefits, everyone will benefit as, as they begin to pay off. But as I mentioned, there, there's, the, the word I use is maldistribution. You go from county to county or sometimes city to city and zip code to zip code, and you'll have a high concentration of behavioral health providers who uh, generally work in affluent communities and work in private practice. And, and that's fine, but you, first of all, the people in those communities who can't afford those services can't get access to them or effectively cut off. And then in other communities, they are true deserts. Uh, you know, there's no 
um, you know, resort economy uh, driving, um, you know, the professional economics there. And so, and yet, there are opportunities. There are countless providers up and down the western slope who are starved for behavioral health and social work. And, and the thing that's crazy to me, uh, frankly, is that this has become a policy priority, uh, rightly so, for states like Colorado. Um, the feds and the state are investing, uh, but there's not a great place for the funding to go. Sometimes they're just investing the same old systems that gave rise to the problem. And so um, by having a strategy that is locally based um, and is not just, again, not just a financial investment, but is attached to the system. So our part of the system is to put networks of providers together, put benefit plans together to run public programs and make sure that we are continuously maintaining that network. Uh, I am very confident uh, for the students that come through this program who are interested in, in working in those settings um, that we will be able to not just simply you know, invest and, and hand them off to the community, but to actively work to place them within our network. And uh, so Grand Junction will be a big part of that. Uh, but again, I, I think we're just getting started. This, this could fulfill uh, the need throughout the entire Western Slope. And, and communities are struggling. And we, we actually see what happens when, when there's a lack, of, uh, a lack of provider capacity. You know, uh, you know there, there are many very well-intentioned people who uh, want to close those gaps, but they just, they just cannot get access to qualified people to, to do the work. So I see this as a closed loop investment. I see it as something that uh, will create a better distribution of access to care, more equity in the community. Everybody deserves uh, a right to high quality health and behavioral health services, and this, this will help make that happen. We've chatted around this a little bit, but I think it's maybe worth putting a fine point on precisely what we're talking about. There's kind of two components of the investment that I think, Dr. Sunkel, your vision has been all along. The first half, of course, is you've got to help somebody pay for the tuition to take the program. And the second component is the amount of work required during that program is such that it's really hard to hold down a job during that process. And so there's all the living expenses oftentimes, which is where the loans end up coming in, right? And so I wonder if you would just take a quick second, Dr. Sunkel, and, and share uh, a little bit about what you see the impact of this financial investment making for a student as they're navigating not just the curricular components, but then the, the practicum and the supervised hours and all the other elements of this work that at least in my initial conversations with folks in the community, as soon as you kind of explain it, there's an aha moment. Um, but maybe you can give us that aha moment and explain it a little bit. Absolutely. So the MSW program is a full-time program. And traditional programs, when you look at other master's programs, full-time is six hours. Our students are doing 16 or 17 hours a semester. So they're required to be in full-time academic work, and then they're required their first year to be in 15 hours of practicum and second year 20 hours of practicum. So our students are very, very busy. They spend all day Tuesday, Thursday with us from seven o'clock in the morning till about four o'clock in the afternoon, and it's academic heavy learning the content and practicing the skills. And then the other days of the week, they're out in the community practicing the skills alongside other clinicians in the community to make sure that they are what we call our signature pedagogy and learning and developing how we apply that information. And so as Jamie highlighted, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to be working part time um, doing your practicum or internship, going to school full time, and then also having other responsibilities and duties. And so when students come into our program and they anticipate or think or have to work, they're 60, 70, 80 hours a week trying to make that happen. That takes away from their ability to engage academically, their ability to apply the content in practice, and potentially make mistakes. And so when we have support and funding for our students, it alleviates that, that they can really 
focus on what's in front of them, learn these high clinical skills, academic skills, go out into the community, provide support and services, and really get ready for practice, and then pick a job they want to do, not pick a job they have to do so they can have the funding, but choose a job they love, that they're passionate about, and then work towards their licensure, which then again fills right back into our community. They can come back to CMU. They can potentially adjunct with us. They can help be site supervisors with us. They can help you know, push this curriculum and these high expectations into our community to elevate our community. I would just say as we're as we're wrapping up, you know, for many years this community has found a way. And one of the, the mixed blessings of being two hundred and fifty miles from anywhere is that we are the cavalry. Uh, and I, I just wanna you know, Dr. Sunkel, for the work that you've done to stand this program up, to our private partners who are helping us um, be site locations, to our students who are pioneering this, and, you know, can't think of a better person to help uh, sort of serve as an emblem of that. So, Jamie, thanks for your, your participation today. But, you know, and our partners in the city and at Rocky, just so thrilled to be able to continue to um, fulfill these kind of partnerships that are truly focused on with a laser what Western Colorado needs and uh, just focusing on that as a partnership. So with that, I, I want to thank again the City Council for your leadership, um, Patrick, for your entire team and the work that you've done. As you said, there's sort of this financial component which matters, but there's also so much more that Rocky's committed to. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, and with that, we'll uh, make everybody available afterwards for any Q&A, but um, that'll conclude the official portion of our, our panel discussion today. We thank you all for coming.